Lots of people will be very sad that we didn't uh, get around to to recording. Okay, back to the slides. No, nope, that's not the slides. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. All right, girlfriend. Here we go. Okay, so um, we are going. To, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, and then I'm going to give you all of your overview of with action steps for your superpower powers. I am going to tell you about the the grown up ADHD playbook, which is a course that gets very in depth to these things and can really help you regardless of the context with which you are working with ADHD. And then at the very, very end, we will have time for questions for a Q&A. If you have questions during the presentation, you can just go ahead and drop them in the chat and I can address them at the end. Um, but yeah, let's get moving. So first of all, who am I? I am Sandy Bean. I have a master's in education in curriculum instruction and creative writing. I have an undergraduate degree in middle childhood education with minors in uh, physics and language arts and theater. And then I also have a gifted endorsement and I taught and wrote curriculum and lectured all the way from elementary up to the college level since 2004. And I now run a 5,400 or so person um, female entrepreneur networking group in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I am also a coach an ADHD and strategy coach for entrepreneurs and people who are ready to pivot and kind of get past that swimming beneath the surface stage. You know, people who really, they have a good life, they're happy, but there's things that they could do better, especially related to their neurodivergence. Um, I have won multiple awards for speaking and teaching. I was a runner up for best networker for best of the Bay last year and am in the top three this year. Um, so I've got lots of networking experience, which is why they call me the connection queen. And I have four kids. All of them are neurodivergent and personally have ADHD myself. Um, and I have been published. I love yoga. I love meditation. I love cooking and eating and shopping and all of those sorts of things. So I have a lot of experience in multiple contexts, working with coaching, educating, and supporting neurodivergent people. Um, twice exceptional people, which are people who are gifted, which just means they have um, an IQ over a certain point, and that have ADHD or some learning disability or neurodivergence, those are my specialty. I am one of those people. You may hear me use the term neurodiverse. I just want to make sure everybody knows what that means. These are individuals whose neurological development is different. Right. So we all know that there's a variance of function in the human race. Right. We all you know, people have different strengths and, and weaknesses, but we've come to a certain sort of situation in our society where things are designed for kind of a middle of the road neurotype. We call this neurotypical and anything that falls outside of that in terms of brain structure and function, we call that neurodiverse, right? So if someone is neurodiverse, if they have a neurodiversity, we typically would say they have like uh, ADHD or autism or dyslexia or dyspraxia. Um, their Tourette syndrome is considered a neurodiversity. So there's lots of different ways that someone can qualify, I suppose, as neurodiverse. Um, and oh yeah, you just said that. Giftedness and high IQ is also a form of neurodiversity because the uh, further you get away from what they would consider a standard IQ score, what they notice is there's actual structural differences in the brain. And there are behaviors in people of high IQ that look a lot like ADHD and autism and things like that. So it's a, a very interesting field that there hasn't been an overwhelming amount of study done. But if you are one of those people that is highly intelligent, and if you are, are an entrepreneur, chances are you are one of those people, please understand that that giftedness may also in, uh, in fact impact your ability to do different tasks. And speaking about things that will impact your ability to do certain tasks, trauma can have a significant impact on neurodiversity. So it's a little bit of a chicken egg scenario, right? We're not sure if trauma creates conditions for neurodiversity in folks or if it makes it worse. Researchers do believe that people who have neurodiversity are four times more likely to develop PTSD after some kind of an event. Um, and they also believe that people who are neurodiverse have more um, incidents in their life that could be traumatic incidents. And if you are 
undergoing some kind of a traumatic event at the present moment, a lot of things that happen during that time to your brain can look like ADHD type behaviors, as can things that occur with PTSD. So if you have trauma and you see ADHD symptoms in yourself, one of the first things that I'd recommend is to make sure that you get trauma treatment because that can A, lessen your symptoms and B, help you decide like what was a trauma impact and what, what actually is part of your neurodivergence, your neurodiverse profile. So down to the nitty gritty, what is ADHD? It's considered a developmental disorder. It is a disability, y'all, like just be aware of that. So you are, if you have a diagnosis, you are in a protected class of folks who have a disability. Doesn't mean that it won't come back on you uh, in terms of you know stigma, things like that, but it does mean that it is protected at work and things like that. It is associated with an ongoing pattern of inattention, hyperactivity, and or impulsivity. There are three types. There's the hyperactive type, there is the inattentive type, and there is a combined presentation. So any number of those things are still ADHD. So a little bit about ADHD in general. Um, it was once considered a pediatric disorder, but now it's understood that many children don't outgrow their symptoms. So hyperactive and impulsive symptoms can often improve in adults, um, but the inattention can persist and it can even get worse with age. The impulsive behaviors look different too. Impulsive behaviors can look like um, road rage, or they can look like if you get angry, like snapping and saying something you don't mean, uh, stuff like that, you know, and so, or like a, a jerk, knee jerk reactions, things of that nature. So even though our frontal lobes develop as we become adults, there are still impacts of those things on us as adults. That's why a lot of times when you're triggered or if you are not resourced, you may react in ways that you're like, oh my gosh, why did I say that? Or why did I do that? Well, it's because of your ADHD. The brain isn't wired the same way as a non-ADHD brain, right? There's something called the default mode network. And the default mode network puts your your focus kind of in whatever the default place is. So people with ADHD have a very present level of thinking, right? They kind of um, focus on the here and now. If something is not in front of them, then they sort of sometimes forget about it. And it, it can get very frustrating for people. It is estimated that between four and 5% of adults worldwide have ADHD. But if you're an entrepreneur, you're in very good company because 29% of entrepreneurs may have ADHD, which is a crazy statistic, right? So if you think about it, it's not that you can't pay attention. It's impaired directed attention, meaning it's sometimes difficult to put your attention where you want it. It's a chemical process. It has to do with nor, uh, norepinephrine and also with your dopamine. And it also is impacted by or it impacts rather the structure and function of the prefrontal cortex and other areas of the brain. So essentially your ADHD impacts the what you do. So plans, goals, task initiation, uh, being able to do something with multiple steps. It impacts the how you do it. So the sequence and prioritization of things, the timing of things. And then it also can impact the why. So emotions, motivation, decision-making, all of those things are impacted by this neurodiversity. And they are on a spectrum, right? So you may find that for you, it's very easy for you to, for example, organize, but maybe you have time blindness, right? Or maybe you're really good at getting started with things, but you don't finish them. Or you don't have trouble being motivated. You're not a procrastinator, you know? So there are lots of different impacts that you will in fact see in your life and it's pervasive. It's interesting to note as well that people with ADHD have propensities towards other co-occurring conditions like eating disorders, specifically binge eating disorder, um, like uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, there's all kinds of different health conditions that we see associated with ADHD uh, people that have ADHD, and there's more research that is ongoing with those things. If you are female as well, your symptoms can get much worse around the time that your estrogen levels drop. So menopause, just after having a baby, certain weeks of the month, all of those things, your symptoms can be exacerbated during that time. So we know then kind of the basis for ADHD, right? We know it impacts our attention, our activity, and our impulse control. We also know that having a high IQ can manifest in symptoms that are similar to ADHD-like symptoms, forgetfulness, um, 
changing the subject when you're talking, things like that, just if you have a high IQ. So if you have both, if you were gifted as a kid or you're highly creative, something like that, and you have ADHD, guess what? It's double for your money. It's double the fun. Okay. So now we're going to dive in to the superpowers. So superpower number one is hyper-focus. Um, if you've ever experienced hyper-focus, it's kind of a magical place if you have to get things done, right? It's, you get so engrossed in a task that you may uh, lose track of time, but you can get the most incredible amount of stuff done when you're in hyper-focus mode. It's, it's madness. Who in, just in the chat, can you just drop a one if you have in fact experienced hyper-focus? It's, you can outperform your peers and tasks that genuinely interest you Hello. because of hyper-focus. So if you experience hyper-focus, throw a one in the chat. Okay, what you got? Okay. Yes, the recording, David, will be available. Um, one, yes, hyper-focus, so good, right? One of the things that you maybe need to know about hyper-focus though, first of all, is it can be very hard to stop. If you're in hyper-focus mode and someone interrupts you, you're going to get mad. You'll be irritable. You'll be like, oh, you don't want that, right? You have to practice with yourself actually stopping when you say you need to stop which is very, very hard if you're interested in what you're doing, right? It's, um, you can intensely focus on those areas of interest and be very productive and very creative. But the issue with that is, again, sometimes it's hard to stop. And sometimes you're going far above and beyond what needs to be done for whatever that task is that you have. So the kryptonite associated with hyper-focus is that you can lose track of time or you can neglect other important ideas and tasks. I've gotten into hyper-focus mode so heavily before that I'll forget to eat, that um, it pushes everything else off my to-do list. Uh, I'm late for things, all of that stuff. So it, it can become problematic sometimes. So if you have experienced a negative impact of hyper-focus, like forgetting to eat or being late for stuff or not getting your other work done, can you drop a two in the chat? If you've experienced the kryptonite side of hyper-focus, Oh yeah, especially after procrastinating and approaching a death. Oh yeah, because then you get into the emotional motivation too, because you got to meet the deadline and the adrenaline's pumping. <laughs> so now forget about it. So for hyper focus, it's like you just go down those rabbit holes, right? Like oh, I'm so interested in this, and then there you go, and all of a sudden it's you know twelve hours later, and you've done the thing, right? So there are negative impacts you can see with that. So get out your pencil because here's some strategies to help you. If you find that you're in hyper-focus mode, but the kryptonite side is catching up with you, here's what I would recommend. And you can do this time, you have to have time limits. Put time limits on yourself for this. And to practice adhering to time limits, you can give yourself lit time limits to make a decision. Like I'm gonna decide what I wanna eat in 15 minutes or whatever. Like I need to decide this by next Friday. You can use a visual timer and set it for 25 minutes and practice taking a break. If you know you have to be done by three o'clock, set a timer for 2.30 so you have a chance to wrap up what you're doing and bind yourself with time. That can actually really, really help. Um, because for the ADHD brain and hyper-focus, switching tasks makes us mad. Then visual reminders, sticky notes, alerts that can remind you of other things you need to do. And then scheduling breaks will actually help your nervous system understand that it's okay to stop and that you will go back to it later. So you have to kind of get yourself used to trusting yourself that, you know what, I love this. This hyper-focus is super great, but I'm safe to stop and do another task and come back to it later. So you have to kind of practice that. It's really important for us with ADHD that we get our dopamine hits all day. So even when you take a break, going out in the sun, moving your body, that will give your body a little bit of a reward that when you take a break, it still feels good. So you're not getting the um, necessarily the word only from the hyper-focus, right? So that is Hyper focus, that's superpower number one. Superpower number two, the rapid fire thinking that we sometimes have. This is your idea machine, right? Um, this is one of those things that, and I honestly, I turned this into a business. I am an absolute powerhouse sitting down with my clients and coming up with creative ideas for them. Um, it's it, many renowned artists, scientists, entrepreneurs credit their ADHD for having creative insights, like really thinking outside the box, you know? So the problem that can come along with this, oh yeah, actually drop in the chat a one 
for me. If you are one of those people where the creative ideas just like spew forth from you like magical lava, it's so good. Yeah, Sharon, when you remember to use it, I feel that. If you are a person that you're an idea machine like this, drop a one in the chat. I'd love to see who else is super creative like that. I know for me, this is one of my most favorite superpowers and it makes me really, really strong on teams of people. And I love that, but I know that I have other weaknesses. So I want to make sure that I'm supporting myself when I hire people who can actually execute these ideas. Yes, every direction, totally. But again, it's about brainstorming, right? If you're an innovator, one of the neat things about ADHD and about just being a creative thinker in general is we're not necessarily fettered by rules and expectations, right? We don't care. We're like, nope, we're just going to come up with all kinds of crazy stuff. And it leads to some really beautiful things, right? So creativity and innovation is a big thing in terms of superpowers for folks with ADHD. So, and obviously if you combine that with hyper-focus, we're like ridiculous. You can see why it's, it's a superpower, but the problem is, and you guys will feel me on this one. And I, I would love to know if you've experienced this, right? You jump from idea to idea without ever fully executing one, right? You have, oh, I'm going to start this other business. Oh my gosh, I want to do this thing. That I would say this is one of the biggest hurdles the people I work with as a coach suffer from. They have trouble making money in their business or they have trouble in their relationships or whatever because they're jumping all over the place and they never really follow through with anything. And so we can label ourselves lazy or irresponsible or all of that, but that's not it. We get uh, our reward center feels stimulated by coming up with new ideas, right? So it feels good to us. So what can you do? Okay, a couple things. You can introduce novel experiences in your life so that it's not always a new idea you're trying to execute, but you can go, you know, experience something different, right? Or adrenaline in other ways, like roller coasters, you know, skydiving, that kind of stuff. Go do things that, that give you that, that hit that aren't changing the path of your business halfway through, right? You can keep an idea journal or use some kind of digital tool to go ahead and jot down ideas when they come to you. I just keep a notebook in my purse and then you can return to them later, but you won't feel the need to act upon them like right away. Oh my gosh, I got to catch this before it leaves, right? Um, you can do that. You can use a prioritization matrix or an Eisenhower matrix. I have uh, that tool if you need it, but it allows you to rank ideas based on their immediacy, their feasibility and their impact. And then you can really focus on executing high impact, um, low stress, feasible ideas first. Uh, so if you have a way that you can prioritize, you can even use a tool like ChatGPT or Goblin Tools to help you. Um, using some kind of prioritization tool is another way that you can help with this. And then lastly, for this one, have an accountability partner that helps you stay on track. So if you know you're working on something in your business and you want to finish it so you can monetize it or whatever, or you have deadlines, make sure you tell your accountability buddy that's what you want and set some deadlines for yourself. So that way, if you're going and working on another idea, it's not in place of something that you are already doing. One of the questions I ask myself every day is, is this making the boat I'm rowing going further? Am I actually taking it to shore? And I try to devote some time every day to those specific types of tasks, right? If you understand this, if you are currently rowing your boat in circles, <laughs> I would love for you to drop a two in the chat for me. If this is something that's, that is a, a source of frustration for you, that you come up with a new idea and all of a sudden you want to execute, I would love for you to drop a two in the chat and tell me, tell me that that happens. Yeah, that one's tough. That one's really tough. And that's part of the, um, the reason coaching and accountability groups can be really, really profound in figure eights. Yes. Or in circles, whatever. Right. Um, but really we can teach ourselves that we can trust that we're going to do what we say we're going to do by being accountable. Because one of the things, negative self-talk is one of the reasons why depression and anxiety are so prevalent in folks with ADHD, because we have such a different process. We expect ourselves to execute in a certain way. And when we don't, we're very hard on ourselves, right? So by spending some time actually acknowledging I'm, a, I'm an idea machine. This is fabulous. But then prioritizing one at a time, we can actually teach ourselves to trust that we are going to execute our ideas and it can help tamp down some of that negative self-talk. So that's superpower number two.
Superpower number three is resilience. Now, resilience is bouncing back, right? It's that bounce back superpower. Um, it's This is something that people with ADHD are super, super resilient because typically you face challenges throughout your life and you've built a strong resilience muscle. And I mean, unfortunately, some of the things that happen to us aren't good things, but we're really good at coming back from them because we got to get used to it. So but the kryptonite with being resilient is obviously continuous setbacks are not great. They're they're not great for your self-esteem. It can lead to significant self-doubt. So if you find yourself not finishing things or, you know, you're getting down about this, that or the other resilience is is great. But after a while, you just get burnt out. So it's important that you avoid that burnout, that exhaustion, and you have ways that you continuously resource so you can continue to be resilient with those creative ideas with that you know things that you can do so the action strategies for this self-care there is it is so important for people with adhd to resource and when i say self-care i don't mean like bubble baths and chocolate y'all i mean eat food drink water sleep you will notice if you are sleep deprived as a person with ADHD, or if your blood sugar is low, or if you don't move your body, that you are a pain in the ass to yourself and everyone around you more so than others, because your brain needs it. You, it takes so much energy for you to execute your everyday tasks that the way that you need to, that if you don't give your body what it needs, it's going to manifest in other ways, like with burnout or, you know, irritability, worse symptoms, things like that. So just resourcing self-care is super important. Um, I also would like to tell you that I know it's hard to meditate if you have ADHD. I know if you've not practiced that there is so much power in cultivating a mindfulness and meditation practice. Believe me, if I can do it, I am super hyperactive I, then anybody can, but it's, uh, it's worth cultivating. So having meditation, hobbies, engaging in activities that rejuvenate you is super important. Um, boundaries. Folks with ADHD, and I'll get to this a little bit in the next superpower, but there's something called rejection sensitive dysphoria that we sometimes have. We're very sensitive to being rejected. And um, it's it's an extreme emotional sensitivity. And it's this perception that we're criticized or rejected by other people. It's not necessarily true. But because of that, we can develop a tendency to people please, which makes boundaries really hard. So saying no and delegating can be very difficult, but you have to have an idea of your boundary, of your limit, and then set set some parameters around it and then execute those parameters. It's It will change your life. And then the last one is just regular reflective practice. Spend at, at the end of every month, build in some time to say what's working, what's not, and how you have to uh, reassess if you're feeling burned out. Burnout in ADHD and autism are they're epic. And when you get burnt out, you are done. Like it's bad. So it's really important that you don't get to that point. I know a lot of people with ADHD that have successful lives, lives they love, but the burnout is always just beneath the surface because it takes so many energetic resources just to function, stay organized, things that don't come naturally. So the more things that you can delegate or create automated processes for, or do so often they become a habit. So you no longer need uh, some, can somebody mute whoever needs to mute, please mute. Um, whatever those strategies are that will help you um, stay regulated, you need to continue with those. Okay, so reflection is super important. Moving then to superpower number four, it is empathy. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing when you talk about emotions and ADHD, because some people with ADHD will tell you that they don't feel emotions the same way that, you know, they're sad, like when their dog died, but when it was their grandma, they didn't feel a thing. Like there's lots of different ways that people process their emotions with ADHD. The research shows that people with ADHD often score higher on empathy tests and show a deep connection for others' emotions, right? So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be looked more deeply into in terms of, of empathy in ADHD. I do know that if you have ADHD, sometimes grieving and processing grief is a whole ball game that's pretty tricky. And it can be just, you get into this depth of an emotional place that can be very dark, or you can maybe dissociate so you don't get in those places. And so handling your emotions as a person with ADHD is a skill and a strategy in and of itself, because it can be really tricky. Um, the kryptonite here is that emotional exhaustion 
can very much be a reality on your day to day. So you can take on other people's emotions. You can feel overwhelmed by their emotions or by your own emotions. All of that is real. So if you, and, and this is where I want to bring in rejection sensitive dysphoria. Um, and I'm interested in your experience with this is because it's literally defined as this rejection sensitive dysphoria is an extreme emotional sensitivity and pain triggered by the perception that a person has been rejected or criticized by important people in their life. It's common in people with ADHD. It is not a diagnosis in and of itself. It is not that people with ADHD are weak. It's that the emotional response hurts them much more than people without the condition. So if this describes you, if, you know, for example, even someone doesn't text you back and you find yourself ruminating on like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? That could be part of your ADHD. And if you are that type of person, you may very much find that you are always at a level of emotional burnout in some degree, some capacity. And that is not, that's not good. We don't want that. If you see yourself in any of those descriptions, I would love for you to drop a one in the chat. Do you identify with rejection sensitive dysphoria or just any kind of, of super sensitivity of some kind, right? Yep. Yep. Me too. I mean, that like was a whole thing dating in high school. Y'all, I was a hot mess. <laughs> like, I don't know how anybody could tolerate me. Um, and I say that with love. I love myself. I really do. I think I'm great, but I was a handful. And I want you to just be aware of that when you feel it's it's physical pain sometimes. Take a step back, take a breath and look at the objective reality of the situation. Are you being rejected? Do you have facts to back it up? And I mean, if you are, how can you regulate enough to get your nervous system into a place where you don't need to react, right? That's the goal here. So how do you handle this type of superpower because you're super empathetic, right? If you're building a team and you want someone who's going to be nurturing and warm and be able to put themselves in other people's shoes, this is your person, right? That is great. But the kryptonite that goes along with that, again, is like we talked about it. It can be extreme. So really being able to embody your emotions and do somatic practices is important. Meaning like spend some time in your body, closing your eyes, asking yourself how it feels. How does it feel to sit in the chair you're sitting in? You know, there's lots of different ways you can do it, but paying attention to what your body feels like so that when an emotion comes up, you can identify what the emotion is based on the sensations in your body right? That's something that can create vocabulary around your emotions. And you can begin to understand if it's anxiety or if it's uh, intuition or, or whatever, there's lots of different things you can do with it. So you definitely want to be looking at those types of exercises, grounding exercises, mindfulness, um, emotional journaling. If you want to take at the end of a day, or if you have a big emotion to brain dump in a notebook and write it down, it can help you process. And this is where you really want to go and find a therapist that understands ADHD and specializes in it. There are lots and lots of free and low cost resources. Um, or if that's not feasible for you, or if you have a therapist, finding a community where you can vent and people understand you is essential. That's part of the reason I like to build communities into the courses that I teach, um, you know, is that we all understand each other and somebody can go in there and be like, man, I had a day and others will feel that and, and get it right. So seeking support, emotional journaling, and mindfulness and meditation are all ways that you can mitigate the impact of this uh, superpower when it gets a little out of control. Number five, your boundless enthusiasm, y'all. So does anybody, and this, this may manifest in inattentive type two, but in my hyperactive folks, it's like visceral to see this enthusiasm. And I'm actually, I have this and, and I bring it to interactions and stuff. And I consider this a major superpower, just a zest for life, a passion for pursuits, infectious enthusiasm, like really loving ideas and, and people and places and just getting so excited about it. Um, does anybody else ever feel that way? Like when you get excited, you have a motor like pushing you and you just have, you're like a battery. If you have that, can you drop a one in the chat and tell me if you have that? If you don't have that, if you feel you have inattentive type and maybe that's not something you have, I'm super interested. You could drop a two in the chat. Um, and like we said, all of these function along a spectrum. So you won't necessarily see all of them for everyone. And if you are, um, 
if you have multiple exceptionalities, like my daughter has autism and ADHD, we call it ADHD. Sometimes some of these will look different, right? Getting that enthusiasm can be tricky in a situation that's unstructured if you have autism. So they all look a little bit different, but this, uh, em this enthusiasm for a new idea, this boundless energy is something that some people have that is considered a superpower. The issue with it is that without direction, that energy can be very scattered. It can come off as impulsive. It can come off as interrupting in sentences. It can come off as, um, it can feel like a lot to the people around you. So that type of energy, while when it's channeled well, is beautiful. But if it's not controlled, it's like a bull in a china shop. Make sense? So what can you do to help? What, is there, what are some action strategies that you can help with that? Well, you can engage in activities that give you an outlet for your energy, like moving your body or art or other hobbies. Like art is a great one. Like I don't particularly like, you know, contact sports, but I love yoga and I love to create. I love to write. I love art. Um, so any of those structured outlets to get that energy moving. If you find yourself and you don't have a lot of energy, those structured outlets can also provide you with a boost. So both are helpful. Task lists. So if you have a lot of energy and you know it's very um, specific times of day that you can be productive or you can harness that, right? And you can put it on a task list and you can create some structure for yourself around executing those tasks. And then lastly, the goal with a lot of these and the goal a lot of times with ADHD that helps us is Mindful pausing. And what I mean by that is before making decisions, before reacting, taking a moment to pause, to reflect and, and make an intentional choice. Because many of us with this neurodiversity, especially those who are, are highly gifted, we our lives happen to us because we fly by the seat of our pants, right? We aren't always stopping to make intentional choices about what we want from a guided place. So all of the work that we do, if you work with me as a coach, if you have a therapist, if you do any you know, cohorts or just do research on your own, a lot of the work rather that you'll do will be in that practice of stopping to be reflective and being able to direct where these things go, right? So a lot of the, the kryptonite items you're seeing come from that, come from that impulsive reaction. However, a lot of the strategies to mitigate that notice have to do with grounding and getting quiet and noticing stuff. So it's it's a very much a skill that can absolutely be cultivated. I've gotten very, very good at this. Um, and a lot of my clients and friends and, and adults that have ADHD, you probably have strategies for these superpowers if you see them that work well for you. There are maybe some though that you're not even aware that you do it and that you want maybe a different toolkit and different strategies will work better for you depending on the different seasons of your life, the different things you're pursuing. If you work for someone else, if you lead a team. So even think about that. If you lead a team and you understand their superpowers or your own, you can build your teams intentionally. If you understand that you have this superpower about this kryptonite, you can advocate for yourself and ask for help. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can help yourself if you see these superpowers. And I mean, really, you can talk yourself up. I'm a super creative thinker. I'm super enthusiastic. You know, I, I can really focus on something that I'm passionate about. Like those are all great and positive things. And motivating yourself to actually recognize them as such is important because when we don't know we have ADHD, we label ourselves with negative things. We say we're lazy. We say we're disorganized. We say we're impulsive, whatever, right? We're stupid. We're this, we're that. But when you know it's ADHD, that label changes, doesn't it? It changes to I'm neurodiverse. This situation doesn't always work for my brain. I'm going to use these resources and I'm going to be able to, to handle it. I'm not saying that you can take the condition and turn it into always a positive situation. We know it sucks sometimes, right? But I am saying that if you give yourself grace and spend some time understanding these things, there are beautiful ways that you can harness the power of your brain. So let's talk a little bit. Before we get to the Q&A, I just want to talk to you about this is the course that I'm teaching that if you enjoyed what we just talked about, you'll get to dig into this a little bit. It's called the Grown Up ADHD Playbook. And the reason I called it that is because it's essentially the manual that I made for people like us 
based on my own experience, based on my educational qualifications and based on working with clients and entrepreneurs and many, many, many conversations um, about creative thinking and about ADHD. So I wrote a playbook essentially, and it's not a book, it's a course. And there are different modules and it is designed for people with ADHD. So I actually wanna show you a little bit about what it looks like. So it's 10 modules. There are action steps in each module. So the strategies I just gave you, we actually walk through them. I give you videos and stuff. There's workbooks, there's videos, and it's all broken down into like wee tiny pieces <laughs> so that you don't um, get burnt out and it's actually manageable for you. It's designed specifically for that. Along with that, you get coaching calls every week. They're hot seat style. So you can hop in and ask your questions. And then there is a private Facebook community. I'm a super good community manager and I love those conversations that we have inside those communities. I have seen some people's lives really do a 180 um, and, and even lives they love to really up level because they begin to understand and have compassion for themselves. Um, with regard to their ADHD. And honestly, like I'm a teacher. So when was the last time you took a class that was actually like written and taught by a teacher? Even in college, man, those people aren't teachers, you know that. <laughs> so um, let me show you the course a little bit as we're screen sharing. I'm gonna just show you, um, I'm gonna show you the back end of what it looks like. So here's the curriculum. It's not published yet because the cart opens on Monday, but here's all the different stuff that we're gonna talk about. We're going to talk about ADHD in adult brains, myths and misconceptions, and then lots of deep dives into emotions. So talking about emotional resilience, we are going to do some actual strategies for communication with ADHD because that can get tricky. So you'll learn not to interrupt if you don't need to, um, ways that you can uh, more effectively communicate your point of view, especially if you're emotional. Uh, organization. I have a guest speaker who, who specializes in ADHD that's going to talk with us. Her name is Diane Crespo wellness. So eating, eating disorders, physical activity, mindfulness, we're going to practice some meditation. This section, a lot of people really love. It's the law and advocacy section. So what does ADHD look like as a disability? What exactly are you entitled to by law? And how do you advocate for yourself without disclosing your disability? That's part of it. And then focus and productivity. So I'm actually going to talk to you about how do you motivate yourself? How are your sensory needs met? How do you manage flow and hyper-focus and all of those things? We're going to talk about time management, relationships, because interestingly enough, there's a gene in people with ADHD that can make it difficult to be faithful, that can make it difficult to maintain uh, solid relationships because out of sight, out of mind can be difficult. So there's strategies you can use to be better at relationships. And then module 10 is just bringing it all together. So that's what the back end looks like. I have some bonuses for anyone who pays in full during the presale. I have a parenting uh, section and then a bonus call at the end. And then I have a bonus call with someone named Belinda Ruiz, who is a holistic practitioner who's going to talk with you all about supplements. If you don't want to take medication, what kind of supplements are helpful for people with ADHD? So when you click the link that I'm going to drop in the chat, um, you'll see this is the page that lays everything out so you can make an informed decision about whether or not something like this is right for you. Typically for coaching calls, I'm $250 an hour. So you get 10 of those right off the bat. <laughs> so like that's a pretty, that's a pretty sweet deal. Since it's my first time working with this and publishing this, I have it for you today. I have 10 spots. I think actually I only have eight seven, something like that, the, at $297. And then it's 597 after that. So again, it's, you know, a few thousand dollars worth of value and you have a lifetime to use it. And if you purchase today, you'll be in a drawing for a one hour strategy call where it will be just you and me on a Zoom talking through whatever things you might want to talk through um, and applying strategies to your life specifically. I use Teachable as my platform and it does have um, afterpay if you need to make payments, it's possible through that platform. So I would love, love to have you in the uh, playbook. It starts September 25th. It is self-paced. So you have all the time in the world to do it, but the 10 calls are the first 10 weeks that you have access to the course. And then um, the bonus call for anyone that purchases during the presale, which is today through Sunday night, will be two weeks after that. Um, so the parenting module, the bonus call, all of that, those are only available for people that purchase by Sunday. But if you purchase today, you get that, um, all of that, and you get the drawing and all of that stuff. So I put my link in the chat and I am going to stop sharing my screen and take any questions or comments or whatever that you might have about all of this.
I know I talked a lot. <laughs> so I am very interested to see uh, what, what questions you might have for me. Any questions, you can drop them in the chat or you can um, ask them verbally by unmuting yourself and turning on your camera. Does anybody have questions about their ADHD, about the course, about anything like that? Anything you're struggling with that you would like feedback on? Okay, well, we've got 15 minutes. Are you sure? Because we can wrap it up if that's that's okay. So what I'd love then is if you want to pop in the chat something that resonated with you, just so I know what was something that was especially valuable to you in this um, conversation, I would love that. Tell me what you um, really found the most value in. And if you have questions about the playbook, I would love for you to join me. Um, each week. Okay. So that's really up to you. Each week is four mini modules. And I try not to make my videos more than say 15 minutes. So I would say if you're really getting studious, maybe two hours. So if you devoted, you know, a half an hour a day to it, it you'd make perfect progress. Um, and I'm designing it too. So you can listen to it and do the workbook as you choose. And it's one of those things that I feel like if you go through it, just listening, for the first round, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, so I would say if you really do a great job with it, two to three hours, but you know that's if you're really going through it in a regimented fashion. Again, you have lifetime access. So if you find that there's a module you wanna go through two or three times, that's fine. And you can ask questions about it every week. Thank you, David, I appreciate it. Thank you, Darlene. Yes, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that you were able to make it. Um, I really appreciate it. And I would absolutely love to work with some of you. This is my passion. I am very good at it and I'm very excited to create some routines and structures for you that can help you just really kill it and take it to the next level. Cause I know how tricky it can be. And if you're a parent, if you um, have coworkers with ADHD, having that magical toolkit <laughs> that you can be like, why don't you try this strategy is, like as a leader, I, I can't tell you how great it is that people understand that I see them and can react with compassion. Yes, yes, Susan, I'm so glad. They are superpowers. We just have to look at them that way. Remember, the world is designed for neurotypical people. We are not neurotypical. So when we, you know, it's that old, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Analogy where you, if you try to teach a fish to ride a bicycle, it's going to think it's stupid. Well, it's kind of like that, right? We don't function on that at that same level. And so we have to be kind to ourselves about those sorts of things. Our synapses fire a bit differently. Yes, I know it's it's tricky. Can you achieve it? Well, the nice thing, Anthony, is you'll have all of that time, you know, it's lifetime access. So digging in and starting is the only way that we ever do anything. And I know for people with ADHD, that, that initial leap, that task initiation can be tricky. And I invite you to just give it a shot and, and see. It's 10 weeks. So if you get in at the $297 price, it's essentially $29 a week. And at the $597, it's $59. So it would be the coaching call and then all of that material and you have it for life. Um, and I'm really, I'm looking forward to having that time to do those coaching calls with, with all of you. I have a great time, you know, people get on the hot seat and they talk about what they're struggling with and just to listen and hear that there are other people in the same boat can be really profound and powerful for a lot of folks. Um, I find for me, as soon as I had my diagnosis and I started to meet other people with ADHD, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, wow. Just because as a gifted person, I expected myself to be you know, great at everything and perfect at everything. And that rejection sense of dysphoria derailed me many, many times in my life. I lost a full college scholarship because of it. I um, made some pretty poor choices in my dating life because of it. But at 45, now I can look back and give myself kindness. But y'all, I get stories from people that I'm like, wow, like, I can't believe you've been through that. And, and there's some validation in them understanding that, you know, it wasn't their fault. Um, there's some grief that goes with that too. And we'll talk about that in the course as well. Yeah, we all have coped, haven't we? And that's the thing. You probably have systems that are great that work just fine for you. And that's, that's fine. But what I find people struggle with most is, again, it's really being able to time block and focus their efforts so that those superpowers can actually show you what they're made of because you've got some structures and parameters around it. It's tough for us to come up with routines and structures and stick with them, but that actually is exactly what we need. Um, especially for men, I find that, you know, if routines and structures aren't 
for women, we almost can get away with, oh, I'm just, it's, I'm just a girl. That's just how I am. Even though that's not ideal, but for men, y'all are expected to hold the masculine and really like have that structure and stuff. And so with ADHD, it's, it's a whole nother level of feeling inadequate for uh, my male clients. You know, it's really an interesting journey for them. And so, um, I definitely like definitely reflect on that and and decide where your life could be better, even if it's fine in those domains that we talked about, right? Your your who and your why and your how. And if you're not getting projects completed, if you have big ideas and you want to execute, um, you know, I'm a business coach. So if you have questions on the hot seats about business or entrepreneurship, I am very, very happy to um to do that with you and for you as well. So yeah, I, I can't wait. And I hope some of you will pop in um, and join me on the course. I know it's going to be fabulous. Um, the value, my business coach is mad at me <laughs> about it, but I really want to get my community as it's growing in on all of this so that I can um, get some feedback from you and gather testimonials and just show other people, you know, the, the value of tackling this. It's all the stuff I did with myself and yeah, it's just, it's changed my life and I cannot wait to do that for you. So if I don't have any questions, if there's nothing that we need, if you don't want to chat, I would love it if you hit me up later with a DM, you'll get a follow-up email with this recording. And um, if you have any questions at all whatsoever about any of this, you know where I am, you can find me on Facebook, or if you uh, found this on Eventbrite, my email is hello at sandybean.com. You can reach out at any point. I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you prefer to have something that's a higher touch, I do have one spot available right now for that. So definitely hop on that 297 price if you have that availability today, because those are going to go really fast um, with, you know, such a huge Facebook community, but I appreciate you spending your lunchtime with me. You still have time to, you know, go grab something to drink and hit the bathroom before you got to get back to work. I hope you have a wonderful day. And I hope that this course was helpful to you. Take care, everybody.